Good morning. Hello, everybody. Good day. This is Mrs. Fuller with Chaos in the Class. Today, we are going to continue reading in the Iliad. So grab your books. You are on page 90 in your books. And are you all ready? We're at the ambush. This book is written by Nick McCarty. So it's Kingfisher Epic written by, of the Iliad, written by Nick McCarty or retold by Nick McCarty. I am Brenda Fuller, Mrs. Fuller with your chaos in the class. This book is illustrated by Victor Ambrose. Now, if you like our videos, make sure you click the like button and subscribe. That way you'll be able to see when our next one is coming up on the Iliad. But not only that, we're also going to add some other little side, quick little read-alouds with mythology so that you can kind of really wrap your head around what's going on in some of the stories. One of them is Pegasus and the Bellerophon. And I think you'll like the way that we stop and kind of dissect it. It's going to make a lot more sense in what we're doing with the Iliad as well. So here we go, the ambush. Oh, we got to a good part yesterday. Remember yesterday at the very, very end, um, it's in the wee, wee, wee hours of the morning and, um, and the soldiers are sleeping and how, however, I don't know how they're sleeping because we know there's a big battle coming up and I know that if I was a soldier, it would be hard for me to sleep. But anyway, they are sleeping. Remember, they've been going at this for years. So they're sleeping, they're um, being covered up by some, um, what did we find? Was it deer skin blankets? Um, so they're, they're sleeping and snoring, and here we go, ambush. Now, if you want to kind of start with your predictions, good readers are going to have a prediction. You're going to kind of go, oh, I wonder what the ambush is all about. And especially when it was ending with last chapter that they were sleeping. I kind of think I know who's about to get ambushed. I'm thinking the Troy people are going to come up to the people on the on the shore and there's going to be a battle right there. Here we go. It was not yet dawn. Sleeping soldiers lay scattered on the cool sand, each with a shield and weapons ready for instant action should the Trojans spring a, a surprise attack. Agamemnon paced the camp with his brother, Menelaus. They met Nestor, who had been checking that the sentries were alert for any sign of a Trojan raid. So they kind of are ready for it. If you know, they're standing watch, they don't have everybody awake. They've got a small group that's stayed awake and standing watch. And um, if something starts to happen or they start to see something, they'll alert. I'm not sure how they'll alert. Maybe scream, shout, you know, shake some things, make some noise, and stir the soldiers up to being ready. Okay? So Agamemnon paced the camp with his brother Menelaus. They met Nestor who had been checking that the sentries were alert for any sign of a Trojan's raid. An experienced soldier, Nestor, carried a strong spear with a bronze head and wore a thick purple cloak against the cold. Agamemnon confessed his concerns about the coming battle. He still believed they should retreat in their boats. The three men went to wake the senior officers. Diomedes slept outside, surrounded by his men, their spears stuck upright in the sand, close together, or close to their hands. Nestor touched the sleeping man's foot. I gotta tell you, if somebody touched my foot, I would jump up. Wake up! Why should you sleep while old men keep guard? Nestor smiled fondly at the brave Diomedes, who picked up his spear and a lion skin that reached from his shoulders down to his heels. Beyond them, in the dark, the war dogs yelped 
and then were silent. Nestor suggested that it would help to know what the Trojans had planned for the morning. If someone were to pass through their lines, they might hear something or bring back a prisoner for questioning. Diomedes volunteered at once and asked for Odysseus to be his companion. Odysseus, who loved adventure, agreed. Diomedes was lent a two-edged sword. He wore an oxhide hat and carried a shield. Odysseus was given a bow, a quiver full of arrows, and a sword. His helmet was leather with a soft cap under it. The rim was covered in a row of white boar's tusks. As the two men slipped away from their own Greek camp, they hear a nervous squawk from a heron in the mob land. Athene sends us a sign, um, sends us a sign, friend, said the older man and he prayed for them to come back safe with some useful information. Then they slipped into the no man's land between the mighty forces and stopped to catch their breath. On the other side, behind the Trojan lines, Dolan, a vain man, had volunteered to cross into the Greek lines to see if he could find some weakness in the Greek defenses. He boasted his intention to go as far as Agamemnon's ship. He had chosen to go alone, as he wanted all the glory and rewards for himself. He made Hector promise that he would have Achilles' horses and fabulously decorate, decorated chariot as re, his rewards. Hector swore by Zeus that he would have both. Mm, making some deals there. So we look in our illustrations of what's going on. You see him venturing out into the dark. Dolan slipped through the Trojan camp and into the treacherous no man's land wearing a gray wolf skin and with a stoat skin hat on his head. He hurried once he was clear of Trojan lines. Odysseus and Diomedes saw the gray figure scurrying toward them. They let him pass before turning to hurry after him. Dolan thought that they were friends coming to join him, or perhaps that Hector had changed his mind and wanted him to return to camp. Okay, so they see the guy, and then let's check what's going on. A dark cloud slid aside from the pale moon. Now, okay, so it, he was under the cover of darkness. Now, all of a sudden, the moon is shining brightly, right? Because the cloud has passed by and it's like a spotlight. And all of a sudden, ready? At that moment, Dolan saw that the two men were enemies. He turned and ran, but fleet-footed Diomedes chased him. And as the distance between them shortened, he launched his spear and deliberately missed him. Terrified, Dolan stopped. Now remember, he didn't, Diomedes didn't want to injure him or kill him or hurt him to where he wouldn't talk. What's the plan? He wants to take him back and interrogate him. Terrified, Dolan stopped. Odysseus and Diomedes took the weeping man by his arms. He begged them to take him alive. He promised gold that his father would pay if they let him live. Odysseus urged Dolan not to think of dying they only wanted, oops, they only wanted to know whether Hector had sent him, and if so, why? Or had he decided to come for his own reasons? Dolan, shaking with fear, told them Hector had persuaded him to come by promising him Achilles horses and chariot. Hector wanted to know if the ships were guarded and if the men were thinking about running away, the two men terrified the Trojan spy. They asked about sentries and passwords. Dolan told him everything. Oh, so one dude is just spilling the beans. 
Diomedes hid his sword behind his back. Odysseus pulled the frightened man into the shadow of an old tree and still smiling asked him quietly where Hector was and if he, and if he had his armor near him. Are his horses close by and ready? Do they plan to hold their advanced position by the ships or to go back to the city after they have defeated the Greeks? Just answer us truthfully, my friend, whispering the cunning fox. And Dolan did. Odysseus asked him for the positions of all the most important warriors in the Trojan army and where their horses were and their spears and bows. Dolan, fearful for his life, spilled out everything. So he's spilling his guts. He's telling it all. And there are two of the loveliest horses I have ever seen owned by the king of Thrace. He sleeps beside them with his glorious chariot near the front line over on the right. The horses are snow white and the chariot is decorated with gold and ivory. The two Greeks smiled at each other at this news. Dolan went on. I have been as truthful as I, as I said I would be. Now take me as a hostage back to your lines. I won't make a sound. Diomedes looked down at the miserable man who had leaned down to clasp his knees in submission. So he's kneeling, giving a sign that he's given up. He took his double-edged sword from behind his back and slashed the Trojan's head from the neck. Ooh, Dolan was dead before he had stopped speaking. Ooh, the two Greeks moved behind the Trojan lines. Close to a group of sleeping men, they found the two white horses belonging to King Rissus. Odysseus killed three guards and a charioteer and then harnessed the nervous horses up to Rus's chariot. Meanwhile, Diomedes silently slaughtered 12 more sleeping Trojans. Odysseus whistled as soon as the horses were harnessed. Diomedes mounted the chariot. Odysseus drove like the wind through the Trojan encampment to safety beyond the Greek front line. Oh, stole his horses. Their arrival was with the wonderful horses and the news that they had killed 17 Trojans and were not even scratched lifted the spirits of the Greeks. While the horses were rubbed down, fed and watered, Odysseus and Diomedes went into the sea and washed the sweat and blood from their bodies, rubbed themselves with olive oil, and then made appropriate libations to the goddess Athene, the archer god Apollo was furious. Okay, so um, they've got blood on their hands, they're fixing themselves up, they're telling what they know, and they are moving on. So here we go, we're going on with war. Dawn broke over the Silver Sea, tipping the looming gate towers of Troy with sunlight. The sharp-eyed individuals could see women on the walls, looking out over the plains for signs of husbands, sons, and lovers. The Trojan warriors were still in the shadows as the sun glinted on the high vaulting prows of the Greek fleet passed over the eyes painted on them in yellow, red, and black, and touched the spears upright in the sand. The Greeks were ready like hounds about to be unleashed. Okay, so you see that the, that the author is painting a picture there, like hounds about to be unleashed. Now, the other thing is, remember, we just left that they had some information they had gotten some other information. The other thing that's going on all of a sudden is the archer god Apollo was furious. Agamemnon stood before them, eager for battle, his red crested helmet sparkling in the yellow morning light, his breastplate in strips of dark blue enamel, gold and bronze, three snakes coiling up to the neck, gold studs glittered, glittered 
on his sword, and the gorgon-faced embossing on his shield reflected the light in dazzling lines into the eager faces of his men, and up into the distant sky where Hera and Athene saluted. Okay, so I had to stumble over this. Gorgon faced embossing on his shield. So I'm assuming that this shield is just like something fancy. Okay? And, okay, moving on. The Greek warriors awaited their leader's orders. They waited and waited. Beyond the Greek's ditch, the Trojan fell in under their captains. The young and glorious Aeneas, Agenor, and Polydamas gathered around the great Hector. He walked into the thick of the army, encouraging his warriors. They would burn the Greek fleet where it stood and slaughter the Greeks without mercy. It was about to begin. Agamemnon looked across his army, said, and, list, and Nestor lifted his spear in salute. Odysseus lifted his sword. It's about to be on. It's on like Donkey Kong. Oops, where am I going? Diomedes and Ajax waited, straining for the words, so they, so that they may, sorry, Diomedes and Ajax waited, straining for the word so that they might be first into battle. Agamemnon raised his spear and roared, War! The wild warriors poured over the ditch like a roaring spring tide. They had no distance to charge before they were in the thick of it all. Through the morning and into the midday, heat it, heat the battle raged. It was savage, unyielding, violent work. On the beach, Achilles heard the battle, but he turned away and struck another chord on his silver lyre. Chariots thundered across the open spaces. Horses were crippled or driven crazy by the noise and blood. Hector and some of the other fighters left their chariots to fight on foot, hand to hand, blade to blade. Blood soaked the sand beneath their feet. Bodies were trampled or thrown aside, and the armor was stripped from them. Arms and legs grew wounds like flowers. Ooh, now I want you to think about that. Arms and legs grew wounds like flowers. Why did the author paint a picture that way? Arms and legs grew wounds like flowers. Shoulders were smashed. Faces were opened up by slicing sword or crunching spear. This was war. Agamemnon did his share of slaughter, sent looted armor back to his chariot, and then sought more Trojan heroes to send to the never-ending darkness. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Remember, these soldiers, whenever they defeated somebody, then they take their goods so that if they had like a good sword or a good spear or a good shield or a fancy helmet, they, they take it. Okay. And then they send it back. So it's almost like a game in, in PE when you're playing and it's like you, you steal something from the other side and you take it over to your fort in your area. That's what they were doing. Greeks and Trojans fell like corn under the scythe, under the scythe, I think is that word. What I'm thinking is, is that um, a sickle is a farm implement that you can go through corn and slash it and down to the ground. And so I'm thinking this word is scythe, but we'll have to put that on our vocabulary list. And let's look that one up and hear a pronunciation of it and really find out what's going on here. So everybody take a look and just jot that into your language arts notebook, page 100. And I want everyone to come back to this word and find out what that really is. Because the author is painting a picture here again. Greeks and Trojans, so both sides 
fell like corn under the, I think that word is scythe. Yet on the, yet on they came. For every man that died, another stepped up and took his place. Zeus looked down from where he sat on Mount Ida. Oh, I thought Zeus was on Mount Olympus. Now he's over on Mount Ida. I wonder if he's getting a better view there. Um, and saw Troy and the Greek ships and the shimmering wave of men and bronze and blood pouring around the feet of the warriors at their work. Hector rallied his men and sent his shares of Greeks to eternal darkness. So remember, that's the author's word for an end of life. So H Hector ended some guy's lives. This was war. Again, we see that this was war. We see that um, several times now that the author has put that in there. So he's really making a point with us. Two brothers begged Agamemnon for mercy, but he struck Pisander on the breast with his spear and flung him from his chariot. Hippolochus, once again, not sure how to say that name. So we're going to go Hippolochus, Hippolochus, leaped down to defend his brother. Agamemnon slashed his head and arms from his body and moved on. This was war. Check that out again. So we got a description. This was war. A description. This was war. I wonder if we get that again. Um, notice the writing, the way that the author is writing and imp implementing. And again, that's just another kind of figurative language that when we write, emphasizing something by, by saying it over and over, given a description, and then this was war. Empty chariots drawn by fear-crazed horses raced in deadly circles among the fighting men. The Greeks swept eagerly over the plain toward the city walls. Agamemnon led his men to the city gates. Zeus, <laughs> Zeus, seeing this, called for Iris, his messenger. Tell Hector that when he sees Agamemnon taken away from, from the battlefield in his chariot, that is the time to counterattack. I, Zeus will give him the strength to take his men as far as the Greek ships and then the sun will set. Hector, encouraged, urged his men to stand and hold the Greeks back. Agamemnon charged at the Trojans. He found himself confronted by Iphidamus of Thrace. Iphidamus lunged forward and thrust his spear under the high king's curus. He leaned his weight on the shaft, but he couldn't slice through the belt. Agamemnon pulled both shaft and man toward him, dragged the spear from his hand, and stabbed downward. Iphidamus fell, pinned by, his, by the throat as he went to endless darkness. Agamemnon was pulling the armor off of the bloody of the body when Kuhn, the dead man's brother, struck. His spearhead pierced the high king's forearm. As Kuhn tried to pull Ephidamus away, Agamemnon struck upward and killed him. Then, even as his arm poured blood, he took the armor off both men and looked for his chariot. So that big deal about, I'm going to take your stuff. The chariot here came close enough for Agamemnon to hurl himself into it, and he... And he and be taken from the battle to the surgeons behind the lines. Hector, remembering Zeus's words, ordered his men to fight harder. Now that the Greek now that the Greek high king was gone, the Trojans came on, snarling like hounds. The Greeks, like wild boars, bloody and hunched in a dark forest, were forced to retreat. Hector came on, cutting into their ranks. The Greeks turned to run, and the Trojans fell on them in waves. Diomedes was wounded and taken behind the Greek lines, and even Machion, the great healer, was wounded by an arrow fired by Paris. Machion, friend of Achilles, 
was hurried off in Nestor's chariot to be treated. He was too valuable as a healer for the Greeks to lose. Odysseus fought on like the lion he was, using his spear as both a sword and chopper. He took down men like a woodsman cut down saplings. Enemus and Chersidamus both fell and clutched the ground. Charips, another Trojan, shut his eyes on the day. Socus bragged that he would kill Odysseus and, wound, and wounded him with a hurtling spear. Odysseus speared Socus between the shoulders. Its point came out through the Trojan's chest. As Odysseus, standing on the back of the dead man, pulled out his spear, he too was bleeding from his wound. Help me, he cried to his friends. Cover me. Help me. Trojans went in for the kill, but Ajax and Menelaus went to the Odysseus' aid and covered the old fox. When the Trojans saw who was protecting him, they scattered to seek out easier prey. Leaning against Menelaus, Odysseus was helped into his chariot and driven away to be treated. On the other wing of the Trojans were being forced back until Hector hurried to join them in the thick of the fight. Trojans and Greeks were trampling on corpses. Chariots, wheels, and axles were sprayed with the blood thrown up by the iron groove tires. Hector saw Aj Ajax defending the wounds. Odysseus but avo avoided him. Aj Ajax looked up from the battle, saw he was heavily outnumbered, and slowly retreated, constantly checking for danger turning at bay sometimes to give himself and his men time to reach the Greek defenses. Euphilus, king of Kos, seeing Ajax in danger, released his javelin and struck the Trojan who was about to attack mighty Ajax. Even hit as the javelin flew, Paris bent his bow and hit Euphilus with an arrow. Your, uh, I guess that's Euripolis, took cover with his men, the arrow still sticking out of his thigh. Behind the lines, Nestor's chariot raced toward the ships and huts of the Greeks, carrying wounded men, including the healer, Machion. At, it passed the ship from which Achilles was watching the desperate battle. He looked down and saw his bleeding friend pass by in the chariot of wounded. Machion was laid down gently and his wound was treated by his own instruction. Suddenly, at the door of the hut, Patroclus, Achilles' friend, appeared. Nestor looked around at him irritably. Look at those detailed pictures. What do you want with us? he asked. We're busy here. I have to see how badly Machion has been wounded. Achilles wants to know. I must hurry, for Achilles is too, is an impatient man. I don't understand why he's concerned with a single casualty when the entire army is suffering. Diomedes, Odysseus, and Agamemnon are all wounded, and Euryp Euripilus still has an arrow in his thigh. Achilles has a strange way of showing his concern. Is he waiting until all of our ships are in flames? And we're, we are butchered down to a single man. I wish I was still young, sir. I'd show Achilles the meaning of courage. Ooh, he's going to turn on his own. And the old man turned away from Patroclus, adding, If you want to help, persuade your master to let you go into battle in his armor with the hordes he brought instead of letting them play games on the beach. You'd bring flesh You'd bring fresh blood to the fight, and we might push the Trojans back. I will try, said Petroclus. He ran out of the hut and along the beach. On his way, he passed Odysseus' ships. Sitting there with Eurypolis, the arrow stuck deep into his thigh. Moved by his bravery, Patroclus knelt on the sand beside the sweating man and asked, 
Is there any hope of us holding back Hector, or will we be destroyed where we stand? Eurypolis shook his head. All of our heroes are wounded, and the enemy grows stronger. There is no hope. Patroclus sighed and got up to go. Before you go and tell your master Achilles that he could turn the day, help me, cut out this arrow, wash the wound, and see me safe on my ship. I know you can heal me, for you've learned the art from Achilles, who learned it from Cherion and Centaur. Patroclus took his sharp knife, gave Eurypolis a sword hilt to bite on, and then cut into the flesh and took the three-barbed arrow out of his thigh. Above them, on the plain, the noise of battle roared on. Okay, that brings us down to omens. Oh, man, this has gotten good. I hope you guys are enjoying this read-along, and we are going to have more of a discussion on this tomorrow. And I cannot wait to read the next part, Omens. I hope you all understand. This is my first time to get to enjoy this book, The Iliad. And I cannot wait to get into this next part. I'm loving getting a chance to read this and enjoy this right along with y'all. This is Chaos in the Class. My name is Brenda Fuller. I am Mrs. Fuller. And I am looking forward to continuing our journey together on The Iliad. Click the like button. Click subscribe. That way it'll immediately alert you when the next videos are up. Have a great day. Bye-bye.